join in a fun activity by Suinio. So please bring it if you don't have one and keep it beside you. Okay. So I guess we can start now. So let me share the screen. All right, a very good afternoon to everyone and all the speakers who are present here for today's Nature Hero Talks 3.0. So um, today would be the last Nature Hero Talks for this year. So Mr. Kendra will be kickstarting the uh, session with his talk called Intertidal Zone. So stay tuned, everyone. This talk is brought to you by NS Marker Branch. We are a voice for nature, and if you wish to be part of it, you may apply for an MNS membership. So for a family, it's 80 ringgit, and subsequently it is 70 ringgit. For youth, it is 15 ringgit, and followed by 10 ringgit. So if it's a club pencinta alarm at school, you may pay 50 ringgit per year, but if you don't have a club pencinta alarm in your school, you can contact us, we will discuss with your teacher to set up one. So if you need more information about this, you may visit this website. So we are not alone. We are a network of 14 branches across Malaysia, all aiming to be part of a stronger voice for nature. So join us. The objectives for this talk would be to provide basic understanding of the environment around us, the stars, earth, plants and animals, and how we can take care of them. The next objective would be to encourage more students to take science streams in particular conservation and environmental courses. So the products or outcome of this particular talk would be nature guide, uh, forest, bird, beach, and second would be regular camping at Tanjung Tuan PD. So this talk is brought to you by ecopartners.online app. You may access all of these, all of these talks in the ecopartners.online app. And one of the main benefits would be students will be able to earn extracurricular activities points. So let me give you a small brief on uh, today's lineup of session. So we will kickstart this uh, uh, session with the uh, Intertidal Zone by Ken Leong from the Beach School and followed by Movement Matters by Sri Neo, and then Speaker Sharing by Dominic O'Sullivan, uh, followed by UNDP Climate Change and What We Can Do by Sharing Hegazi, Testimonials and Students Discussion by six students with Mr. Saravanan and wrap up by Mr. Woody. So today's uh, certificates will be recognized by Ministry of Education. So 80% of the quiz questions will be from the previous talks and 20% from will be taken from this uh, today's discussion on intertidal zone by Kent. So uh, let me remind you, you have 24 hours to complete the quiz. So the quiz link will be given at 4 p.m. Uh, I repeat again, will be given after this whole event ends from 4 p.m. 30th October to 4 p.m. 31st October. So do not worry, you have 24 hours to complete the quiz and certificates recognized by Ministry of Education will be given to top five, uh, top five will be given Sigil Pertandingan Puncapayan or the Competition on Achievement Certificate. And everyone else who have participated will be given the Participation Certificate or the Sigil Pertandingan. So you can register now. You're not late. <laughs> register now inside the app uh, where you can click to attend or participate. Okay. So now, if you're wondering where you can get your e certificates, uh, the normal certificates can be retrieved and the normal certificate and the certificate with the Ministry of Education support can be retrieved from the app itself, ecopartners.online app. And the normal certificate uh, will be given after you've attended uh, the event, uh, depends on what event you've attended. And the certificate with the Ministry of Education uh, support will be given up today, okay? So uh, thank you very much to the sponsors for today's quiz prizes. Uh, Turtle Conservation Society, Dominic O'Sullivan, Salute MNS Pinning for this lovely quiz prizes. Okay, so if you wish to receive latest updates from the MNS um, NS Marker Branch, you can like and subscribe to our Facebook and also our YouTube channel uh, to receive uh, more uh, to receive latest updates from us. Okay, so this is the schedule of the environmental literacy talks. So um, we have come a long way. We started in June and now we are in October. So today we have uh, Life Below Water by Mr. Ken and, and wrap up sessions by others, other panel of speakers as well. So do join us and stay tuned. So is your best friend's birthday coming up or any uh, special event coming up? Why not 
give the gift of life. This is an initiative by We Plant for You, where plant a mango for them and send an e card. So this is a great way to give back to the environment and also give something special to your loved ones. So you can access it through the ecopartners.online app as well. So what you can do is you can click on the promotions button here. Okay, and then, you, then you'll be directed to this particular page, We Plant for You Mango Restoration Campaign. Click on this and you'll be directed to these four buttons here. So click on the sponsor button. And once that's done, you'll be directed to this particular page where you have to quantify the desired amount of saplings you would want to plant. So for adults, it would be 40 ringgit per sampling. For students, it would be 25 ringgit per sampling. So the payment details are attached here. You can bank into Malaysian Nature Society via Maybank. And once that's done, you can uh, name your own tree. But that, that, that is optional, but you can name it. And then you can check to send an e-gift card and also email to the person that you want to uh, dedicate this particular mango thing to. Okay? All right. So here you go, today's agenda. Uh, Intertidal Zone by Kent Leong from the Beach School. So about uh, Mr. Kent Leong, so he is the co-founder of the Beach School based in Port Dickson. He has been fascinated by shore life ever since his first visit to a beach at the age of five. So throughout these years, he has been an avid reader of Net Geo Max, following Captain Jack Fisposter's televised marine Accum accumulating knowledge from nature reference books and learning from NUS marine wildlife publication. By establishing the Beach School, he hopes to influence and cultivate a young generation of shoreline lovers that in turn will care and conserve this unique coastal ecosystem. So I would like to invite Mr. Ken Leung to present his talk for today. Mr. Ken, take it away. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone is well. And uh, I'll be sharing the screen now. Go straight there, yeah. Good day, everyone. Today is the 30th of October, the last of uh, the Nature Hero Talks for uh, this season. Yeah. And my title over here is Life Below Water in the Intertidal Zone. So these are the contents where we are going to go through for this uh, next uh, about 45 minutes. There is uh, about nine things over here. What and where is the intertidal zone, about the high and the low tide. Background and history of marine life, where to find marine fauna, biodiversity of marine fauna in each habitat, what to expect during exploration and specimen collection, significance of low tide for intertidal zone fauna, tracks facing this marine fauna, and how you can make a difference. Can everyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Great. Okay. Because I, I hear there's Thank like you. A no, no response. Uh, I, I thought that I'm just talking to myself. So it's okay. So let's carry on. Okay. Everyone, you can see this picture over here. This is called a, sea, a leafy sea dragon. Why I picked out this particular photo is because that this is the only memory that got stuck in my mind when I was five. Okay, I saw this leafy sea dragon and I thought it was seaweed. So when I picked it up, it had the head of a seahorse. And that's how I suddenly got like, ooh, you know. What's all this? That's how I got interested in uh, marine animals. Yeah, I got interested in that. And this photograph, of course, is from a sea fish blog. Yeah, it's not my photograph, so I have to give them some credit. Okay, now we are going to see how many of you knows about this uh, intertidal zone. Because for me, during the older days, I do not understand what is the intertidal zone. I only know that I'm going to the beach. Okay, as you can see over here, this red circle, the beach is actually expanded from the back shore, yeah, where all the green 
trees and all the vegetations are and it stretches all the way out to this low tide area. Can you see it at the bottom? Can you see my cursor? Can anyone see my cursor? Say yes, please, so that I know. Good. Yes. Can see, yeah. can see that. Yes, huh? Great. Uh, okay. yes. You can see the cursor here, right? This is the low tide. Okay. This is a low tide mark. So this whole area from the back shore right up to the low tide mark is called the intertidal zone. All right. Anyone who has never been to the beach before? May I know? Everyone has been to the beach? Yes? Yes. Yes. Huh? Yes. Okay. All right. If it's it's uh not don't need to be embarrassed if you have never been to the beach before, yeah? It's all right. Okay, this next photo over here, as you can see the top photo, this is low tide. It's just like ordinary land. Yeah. And as you when the tide comes up, the land will disappear and it will be all taken over by a swell of water. Yeah. This is the marine water, which is the sea. Yes. So you know the top there you see the low tide and the bottom is the high tide. At low tide, you can basically walk and explore in this area. In the olden times, this is a place where they come to source for food, yes? For shellfish, for crustaceans, anything that we can pick it up and eat. So this is a good resource for food, yeah? And for high tide, you have to do only fishing. Okay, next, this is where my uh, backyard is now. It's called the Blue Lagoon, Port Dixon. During extreme low tides, you can actually see this seaweed feel of it. You can see all of this area is covered with seaweed, not seagrass, yeah? So when it's low tide, yes, here on the west, coast of Malaysia, we experience it twice a day, yeah, twice a day. And as for the East Coast side, it's only once a day. So in scientific terms, they call it diurnal, okay? Two times low tide, two times high tide, yeah? And here, for the safe exploration hours, it's only two hours before the lowest tide and two hours after the lowest tide. So you have a four hour window to do your exploration. Any other time will be deemed as dangerous, okay? Yeah, what we can see here in Pulau Lang Tengah, which is in the East Coast side, it's called it, sem, sorry, diurnal, diurnal it means that it's only once a day, yeah? I think the previous slide was a bit wrong. It should be semi-diurnal. Here, diurnal means low tide. You only happen like once a day, which is 12 hours of low tide, 12 hours of high tide. So the safe exploration hours will be four hours, lowest tide, four hours to the high tide. Yeah. So before we go into the exploration of the intertidal zone, we always want to prepare ourselves, yes? So this is the gear that we normally go with. Number one, you've got to prepare your footwear, which is very important because in the sea nowadays, it's not just the sharp corals that you'll be facing or the stones or the barnacles, but you also have like glass and other types of rubbish, yes? Here, we want to protect ourselves so that we don't get hurt and spoil the rest of our day. Yeah? And we also encourage you to bring in a small backpack with drinking water, which are compulsory over here. Okay? And also a camera or your smartphone to record anything that you want to. A small towel, some snacks, and simple first aid kit. Yeah? a hat and a sunscreen to make you feel a bit more comfortable to protect you from the sun and maybe a container to hold your specimen to take photo, yeah? Okay, what is marine life? Marine life, over here, we can show you that number one, we talk about the flora, but today 
we don't have enough time, we are not going to talk about the flora at all. Yeah? This flora basically are plant life that has adapted to living in the shallows of the marine environment. Yes, because you see in the marine environment, it's covered with water. Yeah, a uh, uh, height of water. All right. So this water column will determine if it's clear enough, you can have plant life because the sunlight can penetrate into the water. Okay, to let them make photosynthesis and make food. Yes. If you have a uh, very turbid water, you can do so. And as for flora here, it involves both natural and evolved animals that live in this marine environment. So natural fauna that lives in the marine environment, you can talk about fish, but evolved animals are like, you know, we say mammals. Mammals are from land, which they develop web feed or their features change over the millennia. Like uh, you take um, the instance for seals, for dolphins, for uh, whales, yeah, and even otters. Yes, why they are attracted to this particular area is because that the resource and the food source in the sea is so much over there for them. Yeah, more than what they can find on land, so they have uh, less competition. That's why they move towards the marine environment. Okay. Next, we're gonna compare. Okay, about mollusks and mammals here, see uh, how long they have been in this particular environment. Now, mollusks have a very long and rich history. Yeah? It dates all the way back to 550 million years ago. Yes, and mollusks mix up of seashells, uh, like uh, gastropods and bivalves. What you mean by gastropods and bivalves are like Gastropods are like snails that you can find in the sea. Yeah? Those even on land, fresh water, they are still considered as gastropods. And for bivalves, they are actually shells. Okay, that have, uh, sorry, these mollusks that have two parts of the shells. Yes, like these uh, clams, oysters, you know. And here, this particular photo was taken in South Florida during the ice age area, yeah? It has been there since the ice age area. This is found in the quarry quite recently, okay? And you can see that the shells are very well preserved and they look very much unchanged, like the seashells that we find these days. Can you see this picture? This is like a rat over here. It's like a shrew. This is one of the earliest mammals yeah, that we can find. So through science, all the scientists, the paleontologists, uh, they have found this to be about only 178 million years ago. So by comparing the mollusks and the mammals, the mollusks are much, much more older in this world. Yeah? So this particular photo over here, I, I brought it here purposely is because that I know I have a very young audience and many of them recognizes this particular animal. Yeah? If you know, if, and if you have watched Ice Age, you will know that it's called Scrap. Okay? This guy is called Scrap. It's like a half shrew, half rat kind of animal. Okay? It's one of the earliest mammals around. Right? So the mammals are actually very young by comparing to the mollusks. The mollusks are very, very old. Yeah? Even the horseshoe crabs are only dated back to about 400 to 450 million years ago. And it's still called a living fossil. But we have been consuming living fossils like clams and all that for quite some time already. But nobody talks about them. Yeah? Okay? They are not even considered as a living fossil. But you, are, you have been eating them for quite a while now. All right, next, we move into the habitats of the intertidal zone. Why we need to know about the habitats is because that if you know about the habitats, then you know what you can find yeah, around there and what you can expect, what type of animals, of marine animals that you can find over there in the intertidal zone. 
So instead, if you have uh, listened to all our previous speakers, most of them will be talking about the mangrove, the rocky shore, and the sandy banks and the mud flats, only four. Why I have six is because that through my observation, I found out that there is actually more habitats than what is listed inside uh, what science says, okay? At the high time mark on the beach, whatever that you can find there, you cannot find it in the mangrove. You cannot find it in the rocky shore. You cannot find it in the sand bank. You can't find it in mud flats, and you can't find it in the seagrass meadow. Same like whatever that you find in the seagrass meadow in the low tide mark, you cannot find them on the beach, okay? And maybe sometimes you find them in the mangrove, rocky shore, or sandy bank. But they are very, very different, okay? So I'm going to show these animals to you over here. Today, we're going to explore. We just, you know, chill a bit. So from the high tide mark, we're going to move down to the low tide mark. We will start at the beach. Okay. These are some of my students over here. That they are looking at the beach. And you can see all the different names of the animals over here that I've put up. So on the palm of my hands, we can see the snails, okay, which are called the nerite snails. These are the snails which you can find at the top layer of the rocky shore. Yeah? They stay on top of the rocks. But during the high tide, you won't be able to see them because they are covered with water. Only during low tide, you can uh, basically find them. Next, on the rocky shore itself, on the beach, when we pick up some of the stones, sometimes we find a jingle clam. This jingle clam is uh, not uh, very well known, okay? But we have a lot of them in Port Nixon, yeah? This clam basically grows like an oyster, but oyster, you can see them always growing on top of the rock, but this one is different. This jingle clam, they grow behind or below the rock, okay? It's hidden, yeah? And in between the rocks there, you can find some Venus clams, yeah? Always when we go to the shore, we can see the locals digging, digging by the side in between the rocks and they find all, all these clams for, for food. Yeah, they collect them for food. There also they will find this talamita, the swimming crab. And the snapping shrimp. It looks like a mini lobster. It's very small, only about an inch or more. And it basically works together with this gobi. Okay, this goby over here acts as a lookout for this stepping stream because the stepping stream has a very, very bad eyesight. So they both share the same uh, habitat. Moving up to the shore, back on the sandy beach, what we can see over here is called a ghost crab. If you walk along the shore, sometimes you find very big holes yeah, in the, on the beach. And these very big holes are virtually <coughs> dug up by these uh, crabs called the ghost crabs. And normally they are active during the evening, right up to early wee hours in the morning. Yeah. And we also find terrestrial hermit crabs, as this. And on the sand bank itself, if we dig around, we can find this surf plants. So next, let's move to the mangrove area. Mangrove area, it's common for us to find pipefish over here, which basically looks like a stick. Yeah, it looks like a stick. It has very good camouflage. If it doesn't move, you wouldn't know that it's there. And we have this large telescope snail. Usually, you find a lot of it in those disturbed areas where they make for a uh, shrimp farm. Yeah, they're concentrated over there. These are very small snails that you find here. It's called the red berry snail. And then you have the mangrove murex. And mud lobster. The most mud lobster we have seen um, last year was during the oil spill in Pantai Cherni, where hundreds of them came.
came up from their hiding place and from their habitat. Most of them died and some of them we managed to save and we relocated it to the Blue Lagoon. Yeah, if you can remember. And here we have the porcelain fiddle crab. It's a common place to see them in the mangroves and the mangrove horseshoe crab as well. This olive web. The leaf potter crab. This leaf potter crab is very interesting. What it does is that it uses uh, the leaf, yeah, uh, like a surfboard, only that it doesn't go on top of the leaf, but it hides below the leaf. Yeah, it hides below the leaf and it paddles. From the top, it stays away from the eyes of the predator. But it's very funny. You can see that it goes against the current of the sea, yeah, when it moves. So you know that there's something behind or something below the leaf. Okay, next we go to the rocky shore. Let's see what we can find over there. This is a decorated crab. You can see that the body of the decorated crab actually has a lot of hair-like structures that is like a Velcro. So this decorated crab uses all the fungi, uh, what you call, call this sponges and things that it can find around it to attach it to its body for camouflage purpose. Yeah. And then we have the stone crabs, which are very expensive in Florida. We have them here as well. This is not so popular in Malaysia. In Florida, basically, they collect them for their claws. Yeah, one pound of claws will cost you about US thirty dollars. And we have this turban snail, and you can see that a large green operculum in the middle. Yes. We also have mm -hmm. Asterina stars, sea star. These are found below the rocks. Usually, when we go to the intertidal zone is usually in the daytime. So what happens during the daytime is very hot and they will tend to hide just below the rocks. Yeah? And we can also find some sea cucumber hiding between the rocks for shelter. We have the chitons and the rock oysters. We have this estuarine moray eel. We have this sea slug called onk, which you can find on top of the rocks. Usually it's so well camouflaged that you will just step on top of it. Yeah. Sometimes you feel the rock is slippery. Actually, if the rock is not slippery, but you have stepped on top of this gastropod. Here we also find some barnacles called the volcano barnacles. Yes, it also filters water. Now, on the sand bank, what you can see on the sand bank, yeah. Most of them, we see a couple of red crabs usually. These are called soldier crabs. As you can see over here, the sand has all been fluffed up, yeah, because uh, this soldier crab basically, they will gather the sand and filter it through their mouth for food, whatever that they can find, like diatoms that's uh, caught over there, and planktons. You know, and minute organisms. You can see here is a striped hermit crab. Sea anemones, moon crabs, sand bubblers, the ball moon snail, and sometimes you find like you know there's poo on top of it, and these are actually the real poo from the acorn worm they are called casts yeah but they are not dirty like the poo that we normally know that what the mammals uh, put out you know these are quite clean because basically they are already been filtered yeah you can find sand dollars as well and lastly this mantis shrimp we can find just below at the low tide mark they are very active then but 
how we get them is that we use uh, this uh, method called dragnet to bring them up or else you won't be able to see them. They'll be all well hidden. All right, mud flats. Here we have a lot of uh, window paint shelves, which are basically translucent. You can hold it up against the skylight over here there, and you can actually see the body. Yeah, and usually for, for older people like us, we are aware that they are used for decorations. Yeah, especially our grandmother's house or something like that. They used to uh, like string it all up by the doorway, and as you walk through, you will have like that clinging sound. Or you, when you put it up on wind chimes, yeah, we usually use this particular window pane shell. And we have tiger moon snails here, sentinel crabs, spiral melon snails, mud whelk. Mud whelk is a scavenger. This scavenger basically does a lot of work in cleaning up this particular area from uh, the dead uh, bodies of uh, fishes and any other type of organisms, yeah? So when they detect any dead uh, organisms or carrion, they will all come in by the hundreds to consume it, basically cleaning up the whole place. And you can see here, it's a mud skipper. This is a caltrop crab or an elbow crab, they call it, yeah? This elbow crab or caltrop crab is a bit hard to find, yeah? because they are very well camouflaged. The only thing that you can see is just basically the uh, pincers right at the top. And we have coastal horseshoe crabs, and also this big fan muscle. Yeah. Okay, who is from Singapore here? Anyone from Singapore? Yeah, this Professor guy. Sean. Professor Sean and uh, Mr. Saravanan, is it? Yes, I am. <laughs> you know this place called Chik Jawa? Yes, my favorite yes. place. <laughs> Your favorite place, huh? This yeah. is my favorite place too. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually this is one of my first field trips was at Chik Jawa. Okay, that wow. was back in 19, uh, I think 1992. Yeah, back then, when uh, NUS had this particular program to visit this area, they started then. That time, they don't even have the boardwalk yet. Okay. It's amazing. <laughs> yes. So we'll, let's start We'll wait out. for you to come back, uh, Ken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor. <laughs> so what we have in Port Dixon, we don't have, a, uh, uh, sorry, what you have in Chik Jawa, like the Nobly Sea Star, we don't have this in Port Dixon. But I basically took this photo. Okay, because it has a seagrass area. Okay, so you can see that you know you, you have a lot of biodiversity in that particular area over here. Yeah. This is the Nobly Sea Star, which I can remember, and you have the head ons uh, covered anemone. Yes, you have a lot of them over there as well. And then you have this uh, common sea star. Plants you can find. Horny sea cucumbers, plenty as well. And you have this pearl conch, sea hare, and this feather star. This feather star, I want to mention, it's one of the very, very old organism on Earth because uh, they have basically found fossils that dates back to about more than uh, 300 million years ago. Yeah. And my favorite, Fortunus pelagicus, the flower crab. Yeah, good to raise and good to eat. Here, yeah, I want to share with you some short videos of our uh, living fossil, the mangrove horseshoe crab. Uh, just before I go through, uh, I want to say that in Malaysia, we are very, very lucky because we have actually three out of the four species of horseshoe crabs in the world, except the American horseshoe crabs. Yeah, we have the Chinese horseshoe crabs, we have the mangrove horseshoe crabs, we also have coastal horseshoe crabs, but the Chinese horseshoe crabs are only limited to the Sabah area. That's what I was told. I haven't seen them yet. 
Okay, the tribunal does. So let's see. So this is a very small mangrove horseshoe crab, and their size rarely exceeds the palm of my hand. It's a very cute little fella. You can see when I slide my fingers on his tail, it's very very smooth. Yeah, it has a smooth feeling. Okay, let's watch it one more time. It has a smooth tail. If you find a mangrove horseshoe crab that has a smooth tail, very high possibility you are looking at a mangrove horseshoe crab with casino scorpions. See? Smooth tail. Guys, but disgusting at the same time. Oh yeah, what are they saying in the background? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Okay. This is a bigger fella called a coastal horseshoe crab, particular scandus. As you can see on the screen, it's already so big. Let me pick it up and see. Look at it. It's much larger than the palm of my hands. It's robust. Why I picked it up it was that because I saw that it was stuck in this soft sand and I want to move it to a safer place for it. So there it goes. One more time. So, I want to show you this. If you were to observe the back portion, can you see my uh, cursor? Can you see my cursor, anyone? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. 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 Can, huh? All right. So you just look at the bottom of the abdomen over here. There's a pulsating move in the water. That is where it is breathing from. Yeah, the book gills is below, below this second half of the portion of the crab here. Afterward, I will pause it for you to see to look at the book gills. Yeah, this is where its breathing mechanism is. Oops, 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 oops. How do I go back? Okay. Okay, can you see this particular area here? This portion? Yes. 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 Great. So this particular portion over here is called the book gills, where it breathes. Yeah? You can breathe in actually very low oxygenated water because it will flap. And then it will make the water, the oxygen to exchange between the water surface. So it's quite common over here in Port Dickson, where you can find all of them. All right, I'm gonna go to the next. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Okay, next slide. All right, I'm gonna show you some of the other rare encounters that we can find over here. It could be very common in other locations, but in uh, PD, it's kind of rare. That's why I put it down as rare encounters. If you are from uh, Singapore, it might be common. If you are from Johor, it might be common. Yeah? Okay? Or even Penang. In Penang, it's very common for them to see this peanut worm. Okay? This peanut worm. But here in uh, PD, not so. And we have this Jorona nudibram, as you can see. It's called a sea bunny as well. Yeah, the sea bunny. It's hard to find. Yeah? People tell me that it's common, but to us it's not. And the brittle star as well in Penang is very, very common. Yeah? And once in a while we see this cake sea star. Okay? It's as large as my palm. Yeah, you can find it over here. And during exploration on the beach itself, during low tide, what we can find is sometimes the sea pen. 
being washed up on the beach. Yeah, you can see it looks very, very odd. Yeah. You can see that this part which is called the peduncle is basically when it is in the water, it should be uh how to say stuck in the mud, in the soft mud. Yeah. Only this part up here, you can see it, it looks like a gills which actually filters the currents through it. Yeah. And there is also a crab called porcelain crab that basically lives in between. At the bottom right over here, we see the tube anemone. This is also very rare. Sometimes it comes in the color of yellow, bright yellow, or just white color. I haven't seen the pink one yet. And these are gooseneck barnacles being washed up. On the east coast, you'll find it a little bit more. On the west coast over here, mm, not so much. Okay, Because these gooseneck barnacles basically they attach themselves to the floatsons. Floatsons are things like, uh, you know, that are discarded bottles or things that can basically float. Like this is a, actually a, a piece of bamboo okay, that was floating. And they have found a habitat over here. Yeah. And on the extreme right over here, you can see this dog faced water snake. We can only find them during the night. So this photograph was taken at night, but it doesn't look very sharp. So sorry for that. Yeah, because the dog faced water snake moves very, very quickly. Yeah. And the mangrove areas. Hmm. This is one of the uh, most fun activity that we have other than exploration. It's actually doing sampling by using the drag net. You can see this yellow drag net over there on the left. Yeah. What we can scoop up is quite a lot. If you don't use the drag net, you will never be able to see all these animals in the water. Yeah. These are all located at the low tide mark. We do it at the low tide mark. Okay. You can find the common banana prawn, the one that you buy from the market. Yes, it's here as well. And then these are the spotted scats. We call them spotted scats. They are omnivores. They eat about everything, almost everything. And we have this little puffer fish over here as well, the juvenile. Yeah, most of uh, the participants love to look at this puffer fish because you have to provoke it before it can just balloon up like that. Yeah. Okay, here we have this. These are all the catches that we get from the drag net. We have half beaks over here. Half beaks, why? It's because that actually their mouth only stops until this particular area over here. Can you see the cursor? Yeah, I didn't get that. I have an open mouth. This is just the bottom of the mouth, lengthened up. This fish, I do not know what it is. That's why there is no name. Yeah, but it's very common over here. So I have to get into some better reference books to get the name out. You have the cock spurchlet. You have the soul fish, the tongue soul. Needle fish, catfish, quite common. And if you can actually see this, most of their colors are camouflage colors because these fishes over here, they are either silver or brownish in color. Yeah, they use camouflage to perfection to basically protect themselves from other predators. Let's see what others are there. We also have some sardinellas. We have the common mullets and the whiting. We have this hair tail in Malay, they call it ikan tima. Yeah, usually they grow quite big. And I do not know what fish is this as well. It looks like an anchovy, but it is not. This is a, this is actually the how the anchovy looks when it's alive. Uh, I hope the children knows what is an anchovy. Uh, it can be list. This is it can be list anchovy. Okay, this is how it looks like when it's alive. Those dried ones you can actually check out your mother's cabinet in the kitchen and find out what the anchovy looks like. Okay, here. Yeah. This is where my photograph tank is. So you can see that there's a big difference if you have a tank to do photography and the photos that you capture on site, yeah, on the beach. 
So these are the photos which I caught for this juvenile stargazer. You can see the stargazer over here. Basically, what it does is that it floats and you look for food that's swimming up here on the top of the water column. So it will just snatch it. Usually, it will just relax at the bottom and wait for any passing fish before it drops it. Yeah. And I love this fish. This is one of the most beautiful fish that I can find over here as well, the trevally. Yeah. Look at this trevally. When it's a juvenile fish, it has these long ribbons, the hairline. You know, once it grows up, it will lose all this. You wouldn't be able to see them. Yeah. Yeah, we have these four stripe grunters. Yeah, over here. When you pick it up, why you call it a grunter? Because it makes a line. It's a grunter. Okay, or a croaker. That's a different one as well. Yeah, that's a croaker. So yeah. We find this fan belly fowl fish. Yeah. The fan belly fowl fish is very, very common here as well. If you catch it, you can actually touch its skin. It's very, very coarse. It's like sandpaper. Yeah. yeah, we have another thing from the mangrove areas that we can catch. It's called a gray night goby. It's a very special name. I don't know why they call it a gray night goby. Maybe because of the you can see this part over here. It's called a dorsal fin. Is it called a dorsal fin, Professor? Or is it a ventral fin? I forgot about that. So it basically like carries a flag. Yeah, we have this crocodile flathead goby as well. It's a pretty large. It's almost about eight inches when I caught it. Yeah. And you have a sergeant major, but this is just a baby uh, juvenile. It's very common when you go to uh, um, jetties, where you, you can see people throw bread into the water and they all come up and eat the bread. Those are what we call sergeant majors. And we have the sharp nose ray. In Malay, they call it the uh, Pari Daun, which is very small. Yeah. Okay, next. We usually catch hundreds of them, this juvenile striped eel catfish. Okay. This eel tail catfish over here. Normally, when we bring up the drag net, you can see like there are just hundreds of them all in a ball. And we have these juvenile brown sweet lips and damselfish. And this sea perch or siakap is still in my tank, still feeding it. It's about more than a feet now. Yeah, it grows pretty well and pretty fast. This is a good uh, fish food for, for food. Okay, you have seen all the animals already. I think easily over about 100 animals you have seen just now. Now let's look at the observation at low tide. So what I've observed is that during low tide, a lot of these animals will follow the receiving tide to the low tide mark. Yeah? That means you will find them gathering around the area because it has water. Yeah? And these animals over here also, they have uh, adapted in these areas as well. Where you have no water, like mud skipper, they will come up to the shore yeah, and play over there and find its mate and defend its territorial rights. Yeah? But how can it do so? Because it's a fish, you know? So uh, they have to have some adaptation for it to breathe above water. So what it does is that it has, you can see these pockets, these two pockets here, yeah, behind the gills, that's where it stores its water to breathe. Okay, that's how it does it. And during low tide, they also find shelter below the rocks, like the estuarine moray eel. When we pick up large rocks, usually you can find them hiding just below where there is water. Okay, 
and they also burrow under the substrate, like the uh, uh, crabs. Yeah, they do burrow under the substrate, which can be mud, which can be sand. Yeah, and some gastropods, what they do is that they retain and seal water in its shell to to preserve themselves and stay away from desiccation. Yeah, that means dryness, because gastropods. Like the marine gastropods, they cannot be in a dry environment, it will soon die. Yeah? And to adapt in and breathe in oxygen poor waters, like the, what they develop for these uh, horseshoe crabs is that they have the book gills that I show you just now. Okay, that's how when once they move, move the book gills, they will get some oxygen exchange into the water from the air. Okay. I found that there is also a lot of significance of at low tide here. Why I say that low tide is significant is because that without low tide, certain animals or a lot of animals will die. Okay. Why? Number one, we see it allows hidden marine life to emerge. What types of marine life emerge during low tide? Like the soldier crab that you seen earlier, like the fiddler crabs, they will all come out from their hiding place. During high tide, you won't be able to find them. Only during low tide, yeah, they will come up. So what will they do? They will forage and they will scavenge for food at that particular time. And they will also look for a mate. And at the same time, some of the gastropods will lay eggs because at that time, it's when the eggs can adhere or can stick to a substrate. right? So that's why they come out and lay eggs at that particular time. And also for the crabs, they like low tide because during that particular time, they can move safely. Because if you have a large column of water, all the predators are around, you are not safe. Because when you molt, okay, when you molt, your body that comes out from the old shell is going to be very soft for at least two hours. So during this particular two hours, you need to stay away from the predators. So what do they do is that they find the shallower spot and they mow safely from there. Okay, here in uh, Port Dixon, it's rather safe. It's because that we do not have large uh, or a lot of predators like the seabirds. Okay, that comes and hunt for all these animals. So they are quite safe over here. And here I will share with you. What the gastropod looks like and how it moves and how it disappears under sand. This is a ball moon snail that's on the palm of my hands. You can see the top over here. This is a siphon where it breathes. This is how it moves. You can see the skin is a bit translucent, the flesh is translucent. It might be a little bit ugly to some of you. Okay. Sometimes you go into the beach and then you say you, it's so boring, you don't find anything. It's because most of the animals are already hiding below the sand. See how it goes in for a gastropod like this. This mollusk just buries itself in so easily into the sand. You want to watch it again? One more time. So for those who have never encountered this kind of animals, it's about time that you all take a visit to the beach. Hey. OK. 
Okay, bye bye, Moon Snail. These are predators, by the way. All right, let's come to this. Next, we want to look at what are the natural threats that these intertidal zone creatures encounter every day yeah, in this particular harsh environment. Okay, because you have your tides yeah, twice a day, you will encounter dryness, okay, meaning that the tides will go out and it will leave you high and dry. That's why there's an English word saying high and dry, it's like that. Okay, you are at the intertidal zone. So number one is the absence of water. And during the day, the rising temperature will kill you. Yeah, you don't have an umbrella. The gastropods don't have an umbrella. The fish don't have an umbrella. Okay, so the rising temperature will also lower the oxygen levels, even if you are safe in the tight pools. Yeah, because those tight pools sometimes when you put our feet in, it basically like burns us because why it feels like boiled water. It's so hot because of the climate change, yeah. And uh, intense, the, the intensity of this heat is really, really unbearable. And the other, the last one over here is the risk of exposure to predators. This is true to throughout the world, but uh, to Podixon over here, as I said, the birds are a bit less, so it's not too much. Okay. Next, these are the man-made disasters against marine life, which we encounter. Number one is climate change. You know, and we have talked about it all throughout this whole season. Overfishing. Overfishing, you might not hear too much about it, but really we have depleted our seafood source by a lot. But lucky thing, during this MCO period, it has showed us that within this just this one particular year, of not going out to do fishing and all that, the stock, the fish stock just came back just like that. I can witness it in front of my beach because you can see huge schools of fish suddenly turning up, which we have never seen before. Okay. And then we also have this microplastic pollution. I don't need to tell you much about that. You will already know about that. Coastal development. And over here, this photo was taken during the oil spill at Pantai Germany. And we are over here to pick up the marine trash as well. Yeah. So these are all real threats to the marine environment. And you can see on this particular beach over here in Dumun, right? You can see that the wave, whatever that the sea doesn't like, it will throw back up to you. Yeah. Whatever you throw, it will throw it back up to you. This is what you have actually thrown into the water. Yeah. And then Mother Nature say, I will serve it back to you and now you go clean up. So how can you actually help to reduce all this kind of garbage? It's so unsightly. Number one, create awareness. Yeah? Only if you share it with the general public, we hope that we will trigger them you know, to be aware that throwing rubbish indiscriminately is hazardous to all of us. Yeah? And number two, educate the people around you. You don't need to talk to strangers. Talk to your parents, talk to your uncle, talk to your cousin, talk to your grandparents. If you see them doing something which is not uh, really good, you should just remind them and just educate them a little bit. Yeah? And we also try to reduce the use of plastic. Okay? Because plastic, it's, uh, it can stay in the environment for more than four to 500 years. Undisturbed. So you got to dispose of your trash responsibly. And here I find that practicing nature appreciation is the most important of all. If every one of you practice nature appreciation, you would have the initiative to start off with whatever you want to do. Okay? Just like how I started up, it's because of nature appreciation. Yeah, and I'm willing to do things, I'm willing to initiate things. And I, basically, all of us can volunteer yeah, in cleanup events and stuff like that. So it's up to you, really. So what do we do during our cleanup events? Number one over here, we always start off with a briefing to tell 
uh, everyone who is participating, what are their roles and what are they trying to achieve for the day and what do we want to get done, okay? Before we get to the action plan, everyone will have a bag, yeah, we will try to clean up. And you see number three is very important, you know, is it? What is this number three? It's called break for lunch. If you don't have a lunch break to motivate all, all of you, none of them will come, you know. So your, your, your break for lunch is a very, very important time where you can talk with everybody, yeah, and motivate them to do more work. So after lunch, you can continue, you see. You resume your cleanup activity. Everyone is smiling and happy over here because when you are hungry, you are angry, you know. So we always want to get them well fed so that they can continue their work, okay? So you can gather everything, all the collection before we move to the next stage over here, okay? The next stage is that once you gather it all, we will lay them out, you know? We sort out the trash, okay? We sort out the trash. Why we want to sort out the trash? It's because we want to tabulate, yeah? Look at them, they're tabulating. How many bottles you are fine for the day, yeah? How many uh, pieces of cigarettes and all that? Because we want to input all this data into an app called the Cleanswell app, okay? How many pieces we want to put it in? Because without this data, you cannot talk to any of the authorities, okay? They say you plug this uh, figure from air, you know? You cannot say like that. So you say, that, oh, here. Yeah. These are the actual numbers that we have counted, we have tabulated. And actually all this data, when you told sorry to interrupt, this particular Mr. app. Ken? Yeah, we're going to end already. Uh, sorry to interrupt, one. Mr. Ken, yeah. we are running. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so we input into the app and then we put, put in all the data, okay, for them to use in the UN convention, all right? So that was the end and you can see, thank you to MNS and all these members who have come to do for volunteering. You can see how much trash we have removed. Uh, Harris and Wuti will remember it very much and even June and all because Wuti found basically this, this biggest piece of trash, which is the, uh, what is it Wuti? What did you find? Which car part do you find? Is Wuti dashboard, still around? Dashboard. It's a dashboard, remember? <laughs> A dashboard on the beach, you know, you can find this dashboard on the beach. See what kind of trash you can see. Okay, I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed everything. So should I close top share? All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ken, for bringing us on a virtual journey. Okay by showing us all the unique uh, and unknown species in the intertidal zone. It was a virtual treat. So um, now I'm gonna pass it to Mr. Sarvan for the Q&A session. I think we have time for only two questions. So I'll pass it over to you, Mr. Sarvan. All right, thank you, Lelisha. And thank you, Ken. That was really, really awesome. You know, wonderful pictures. And I think I have never seen some of those animals before in my life as well. So it's really, really great. All right, we have a few questions over here, but because of um, shortage of time, so I'll just keep it to two or three questions here. So the first question that we have here is that, what is the most dangerous encounter you had in the intertidal zone? You can unmute it. Um, uh, you're, you're on mute, Kent. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Okay, my most dangerous encounter was when I was laying nets. Okay, when I was laying net with my in-laws. So uh, I went with my brother-in-law and my father-in-law. So what happened is that uh, there was this feeling. I, I, I was holding the torchlight, you know, at night. <laughs> so everything was pitch black. So I, I hear that there is some like fish or something that is swimming towards me. And I was oh. shining the, the torchlight. It was attracted to my light. So I suddenly realized that, you know, I have to deflect it away. So I was very cheeky. I pointed my light, the, the light to my father-in-law where he was holding the, the fishing net. 
So true enough, the fish directed <laughs> his position and straight away ran into the net and surprised him, made him jump. <laughs> oh, but I was not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That, that would have been quite hilarious as well. Yeah, that was very scary because you do not know what you're going to encounter during the night. Yeah, yeah so that's true. Night fishing is like that. Mm, night fishing. Okay, second question. Yep, all right. Let's go to, okay, how about this one from Akashi? Uh, do horseshoe crabs have a poisonous sting? Uh, no, not at all. So uh, yeah. when you talk about sting, you're talking about the tail. The tail is very sharp. Actually, they use the tail just to ride themselves if they are like, you know, over, uh, overturned on the beach. Yeah, they have, they have to turn it back to the other side. So they have no other appendages that is uh, long enough. The limbs are not long enough, so they have to use the tail. So try not to break their tail, please. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do not have that kind of intention because some of the fishermen I, I know, when they get entangled into the net and all that, they try to break their tail because it's easier for them to get them out of the net. Mm -hmm. So the tail is actually an appendage for them to right themselves. If not, they will surely die. That's all that I can see. I see. All right, that's great. That's great. And and we'll just keep to one last question. I think this is a very interesting question. Um, okay. you, you were showing the, the, the beach cleanup and what yeah. kind of trash or what type of trash that you have seen most in every cleanups that you do? Most, uh, most I can tell you it's the styrofoam. Mm -hmm. The styrofoam is the worst because bottles, you can still count them and styrofoams are like, you know, they break up into very, very small pieces and it's very hard to clean up. I can just stay on one spot for like half an hour just to pick up styrofoam. You know? Water bottles are very easy to pick up. Actually, I like to pick up more water bottles than styrofoam. Pieces. <laughs> You know, several people are really torturous, you know, for us to do. They're so small, even though, and they're so light, and it's easy for them to be washed up onto the beach. But to me, styrofoam is the worst. Not bottles. Bottles is easy for me to pick up. Styrofoam is bad. It's just bad. Yes, okay. yes. I, I, I think I will agree with you because I've done my cleanups as well and styrofoams were like breaking into small pieces. I think uh, all those that we have collected may not even make up to two styrofoam plates probably, but it's still a lot there to pick up and that's a lot actually. Mm. All right. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Ken. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the journey with me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Denisha, back to you. If you want me to answer, it will be after the show. After the show, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Do that. All right. Thank you very much for this amazing Q&A session. So let's move on to our next, uh, next session. Okay, so the next session is Movement Matters by Srinu. So in this uh, session, uh, Srinu has been a learning coach, soft skills training consultant, and and a volunteer teacher for special needs children. She now combines her passion in education, nature, and holistic wellness to heal and help others. Let's enjoy some movements led by her today. So everyone, I request all of you to switch on your cameras because this is going to be a very interesting session. All right, take it over. Thank you. Uh, I think... Uh, you're muted. Mute. Yeah. I'm already unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Now you can. Okay. Right. <laughs> Microphone is there. Good, good. I was testing your, your, your hearing as well. <laughs> We've been sitting for almost one hour. And for me, who do a lot of movement, I'm going to bring you all to do a short movement matter because movement matters. Now, before the session, I asked for either... Uh, a softball or a tennis ball. If you have a bean bag, that'd be great. Or a softball, if you don't have, you can bring an orange, okay? So please do that. What we will do is a five minute session. And this is something you can do daily because you know why? We are always on Zoom. And when you are on Zoom, your eyes are zooming in, your ears are listening to the electronic sounds, your hands are only doing this and you sit for far too long. So come along with me. I will remove my virtual background so you all can see what I'm doing and move along with me, okay? All right. I will want to see all of you. Hey. Yeah, it's great. I can see all of you. 
So if you have a tennis ball, this is something that you can do very easily, right? See what I do? I'm going to make this movement here, like this. Ah, very easy. You have to stand up, move your ball, okay? Right, very good. Yes, if you stand up, you'll be excellent, right? This is one movement. And if you can see what, what figure I am doing right in front of me, can anyone just shout out, what figure is this? What do you see over here? What figure is this? Eight. Yes, it's the figure eight. Right, so I'm doing top, right in the center, and then at the bottom. Excellent. The other movement that you can do with your tennis ball is like this. One hand under the chin, okay? Right below your chin. And your other hand underneath your belly button. So find your belly button underneath your belly button. What we are going to do is we're going to drop it and try to catch. And then reverse. Yeah, try to catch. Try to catch. Yeah, not make it fall. <laughs> okay? And don't, don't cheat. Don't get it nearer like this. Okay, there's no test here. What I want you to do is to cross the horizontal midline. That means your, your belly button is like a midline. Cross that midline. Not midlife crisis. Yeah, it's crossing the midline. Very good. Yes. That's the second movement. The third movement is going round you. I want you to feel how is it like forward, backwards, okay? Just going round clockwise. Very good. Clockwise at your waist level. Excellent. Nice. The ones that I can see. Yes, I know. Wow. Uh, Yoban Raj here, doing it very fast. Do it nice and slow, okay? Nice and slow. Very good. So, the, so Yovan Raj, I know you're very good. And some of you all are playing. Yes, uh, Lumping is also doing excellent. Uh, Bichu, I also see you doing it. Very good. The rest, very shy. Don't turn on your videos. What I want you to do is this. I challenge you to do this, okay? This is easy. Lift up. All right. The ball goes under the thigh. Like this. Yes. Very good. For you, very easy, right? The ones that find it easy, you do this. Throw it up. Catch. Okay. <laughs> And in front of you, yes, this is excellent. That means it goes right in the middle, okay? Don't drop it. Very good. And one last movement. This is for those who can do it very well. Wow. Behind. Okay, I'm going to turn behind and you can see what I'm doing. Behind you, make sure you are standing straight. Behind you like this, okay? Catch. Throw and catch. Throw and catch. Throw and catch. Try to do it. Very good. Throw and catch. Yeah, if you drop it, it's okay. Just pick it up again. Very good. Yeah. It's a stretch. Like not that easy, right? Okay. So if you're going to put it all together in one whole session, this is how it looks like. So I'm going to just share so that you can see me. Just very easy. And the best is if you can do it together with a nursery rhyme. So I'm going to chant a poem and I do the actions. You all do it with me, okay? Wow, Anna is at the... Anna, is that a garden that you're in? Wow, lovely. Okay, right? guys, ready? We do it, okay? Someone came knocking at my wee small door. Someone came knocking. I'm sure, sure, sure. I listened. I opened. I looked to left and right. I thought there was a stirring in the still dark night. Only the busy people tap tapping on the wall. Only from the forest, the screech owls call. Only a cricket whistling while the dew drops fall. So I know not who came knocking at all, at all, at all. Wow, excellent. Good, right? For you to do this, okay? At any time you feel tired or you've sat too long, just stand up and do this. And for those of you who are so good, right? Yovan Rush, Learn Ping, Anna, you guys are, okay, I see those at, inside there as well. Veronica, right? Excellent. If you have two, okay, this is for you, huh? If those who have two and want a challenge, this is something that you can do. You have two, walk forward with a tennis ball, or walk backwards with a tennis ball. Okay? This is a challenge for you. So next time I meet you all again, this is something I want you all to show me. Okay? Okay, back to you, Linisha. 
All right, thank you so much, Rina. That was an amazing session, it was very refreshing. Although I missed most of the exercises, but I assure you I practiced. So everyone, let's start practicing. <laughs> and we'll meet you in the next uh, yeah. session and we'll, and we'll uh, nail it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's move on to our next session. Okay. So the next would be, yeah, the next would be speakers sharing by Dominic O'Sullivan. So about uh, Dominic O'Sullivan, he has been a resident in Malaysia now for four years. From an early age, he had a passion for nature and he got a degree in zoology. He has focused on the wonders of rainforests, their biodiversity and conservation, and has been a member of MNS since 2017. He recently trained as a climate reality leader, uh, giving talks on climate change and raising awareness of the seriousness of the climate emergency and what we have to do to address it. So I, um, I invite Dominic O'Sullivan to present his talk today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just trying to engage the share screening now. Okay, can we all see that? Can we all hear? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, right, uh, a quick sort of summary of where we are with climate and what's been happening over the last six to 12 months. Um, as you know, Sarav and I gave a, a presentation earlier in the year, so around June, and um, I want to start with the, very quickly with a, a video I've just recently seen, um, and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, Dom, looks like there's no volume in it. Uh, looks like the, the audio was not shared. Uh, yeah, the audio is not shared. Uh, Mr. Dominic, I think you didn't share the sound for this uh, video. Uh, Dom? Yeah. Uh, the did sound we, did is we not get sound? Nope. Okay. We can't hear. Yeah. And let me tell you. Are you getting it now? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Listen up, people. I know a thing or two about extinction. And let me tell you, and you'd kind of think this would be obvious, going extinct is a bad thing. And driving yourselves extinct? In 70 million years, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. At least we had an asteroid. What's your excuse? You're headed for a climate disaster, and yet every year governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Think of all the other things you could do with that money. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? Let me be real for a second. You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, 
This is humanity's big chance. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. I think you got the gist. <laughs> right, climate change will likely lead to food and water shortages, pandemic diseases, we know something about that, disputes over refugees and resources and disruption by natural disasters in regions across the globe. And that's what we're rather seeing, isn't it? Now, in since 2002, uh, there've been the hottest years on record and the hottest set last seven years are the hottest ever. 90%, 3% of the extra heat trapped in the, the man-made global warming pollution goes into the ocean. That's a huge amount. Then we get from that, we all, you've all seen these pictures, globally floods, so extreme rainfall events now occur four times more often than they did just 40 years ago. That's serious. Things like this you didn't see 40 years ago. Now we see it a lot. Hurricane Ida, landfall in Louisiana is a category storm with winds of 241 kilometers an hour, massive. Strangely, massive flooding as well in places that we've never been used to having it. I come from Europe, Western Europe and Germany um, in, uh, is one example. France was another, the UK was another, um, but all over the world here. This is Maryland and imagine that has been a street until recently. Now, well, you wouldn't even risk kayaking in that, would you? But it also comes with man, lots of landslides and things because the rain is so excessive, it destabilizes the land. And it's happening all over the world, in Indonesia, um, in Guatemala, South America, you name it, we see the pictures all the time. It's also one of the effects of the, uh, the surges that come in with the tides is that all the low-lying countries are at threat. And Bangl places like Bangladesh, they can have all their arable land contaminated by seawater and rendered uh, useless for crops. Therefore, a million people are already migrating north. Floods are not so far away from us here either, are they? We've seen this now several times. We're going to see a lot more of it. But the converse is also true. So as parts of the world, we have uh, droughts, the same disruption to climate and weather patterns. Uh, this was the, the River Loire. And, um, famous for lots of vineyards, but um, not so much recently. They've been seriously affected. And so many reservoirs deprived of water, that leads to massive droughts all over the world. Kazakhstan, Turkey, Australia, even now in, in places like Madagascar. Um, kids over here are dying, but in fact, it's not due to anything other than the effects of climate change. There's just no food around for them to grow. So we need to do something about that. Hold on, got a sticky. My screen, sorry, it stuck for a moment then, sorry. Um, so the gravest effects of all the attacks on the environment are suffered by the poorest, as you saw in that last photo. And the other, what also comes with that, because the land is so dry, we have uh, massive forest fires and wildfires all over the world, Australia, Turkey, all across Southern and Eastern Europe now. And the ice caps are melting and the glaciers are melting. This is a glacier in, in uh, South America. Um, the picture was 18, uh, 1928, uh, but the second picture is, is under my caption here. It's about 2018, 2014. Where's the ice gone? It's gone, and at the moment, there's no prospect of it ever coming back. So we've got to get used to different things and situations in our world. And my screen, for some reason, is sticking again. There we go. Warmer temperatures already increase uh, as well. They affect the quality of the food that we produce agriculturally. They affect the quantity of the food that we get agriculturally. And, and that is not good news, particularly when we're then having des des desertification like here uh, and when uh, along with that you get pestilence and I always thought that was mainly in Africa but this is an example of South America. The earth currently has uninhabitable zones, they're those big black blotches mainly across Central Africa. 
However, if we carry on the way we've been going, we will find the situation changes and becomes like this. And notice this is our part of the world. Can you imagine all our rainforests have gone and uh, we're left with uh, just dry lands? How's that going to affect everything? The big challenge now is to make sure, of course, that that doesn't happen. So the main reason people were moving away is because they don't have enough to eat. And if we don't do something about the change in climate and weather patterns, there will be millions and millions and millions of people with not enough to eat. 10 cities that most risk from uh, uh, sea level rise as a result of all the ice melting. Well, of the 10, guess what? Nine of, that, of those 10 are, are in our part of the world. It's not helped, unfortunately, by deforestation. And uh, as of 2019, Malaysia was up there at number six um, in terms of the, the rate at which we cut down our forests. And we've only got 15% now of our natural forests left. So that's not very good. The climate crisis is also an extinction and biodiversity crisis. We risk losing up to 50% of all our land-based species in, in this century. And already back at 2012, it was estimated we'd lost just about 50% of all our marine vertebrates. These are huge numbers. What we've been doing, we all know this, this game, we have been playing Jenga with nature. And we all know what happens around here. Somebody will either take out too much water or, or will chop down too much forest, but one of these bricks is gonna come out and the system won't just fall, <laughs> it will collapse. That's not so good. However, there's a lot of good news without all this carnage going on. There is actually enough solar energy in the world to, to run the whole world for an hour. Okay, and we've got to do something about that. But we may have seen peak fossil fuels, which are the main cause of global warming, that may have topped out. Shell announced that its solar total oil production probably peaked in 2019. BP is shifting most of its investment uh, to um, look into alternative energy sources. Already in the United States, huge numbers of, of uh, coal powered fire stations. Sir Avanan, at least I got that right. Um, 1.2 billion coal fire power plant in Australia, its newest, it's now worthless because coal is being replaced and phased out. All these countries are getting rid of coal, okay, and coal powered fire stations. Renewable energy made up almost 90% of all net new electricity capacity in 2020. We've got to keep that going. 35 cities have already obliged, uh, committed to getting down to zero emissions uh, by buying buses that uh, do not run on fossil fuel. That's a big step forward. Um, phase out begins for cars in all these countries uh, over the next decade. Um, certainly, I've been keen to look at what the UK is doing, but Singapore even is 2040. We haven't got a date yet for what uh, Malaysia is going to do. But we all need to do it. And with that new power, we can educate and supply power to all the world so that even in these remote communities of Africa, they can get to the internet and learn about what they can do. The reason all that's happening is the cost of that technology has dropped sharply. The quality of, of the goods and the items that we're developing has improved dramatically. And all the low-income nations that had no landline grids can now leapfrog that technology by just putting out a, um, a small solar panel and they can drive PCs and goods and so what else. Where do we start? Well, we start at home and in our daily lives, at school, at work and in the world outside. We go out of our way to learn, to engage, and to participate. There are plenty of uh, sources of information and articles out there. Uthi's already got a list of articles that um, are relevant to this sort of talk. Um, what can we do together? Well, we can protect the environment. Um, it's already been touched on, but there's lots that we can do out there. Learn about it, see how vulnerable it is, and then protect it. Reduce our CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions promote renewable energy. There's lots we can do. LED lighting uh, is likely to be 85, 90% of the market for lighting in the next few years. Uh, adopt a circular economy. Some of you may not understand that term, but it's about using things more than once, okay? And not just a linear economy, which is used once and throw away. So wasteful. Better waste management. Uh, 
recycling is just one instance. Um, lots of things that we can actually do to make sure that we get the best out of everything we use. Reduce food waste. Food waste alone generates about 15% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Can you imagine that? That's food we throw away. Not the way to be doing it. Join a conservation group. Great fun like going on your, on your beach cleans and learning about all the amazing creatures that are just down in that one ecosystem. And where we can, firstly, especially for the older viewers here, find support and elect the right leaders who understand the importance of dealing with the climate challenge. Now, one last thing, next uh, week, uh, we have uh, COP26, a big meeting of uh, all the nations regarding committing to making sure we turn the climate crisis around. It's a make or break. We're all going to be watching this eagerly over the next few weeks to see what targets come out. They're going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be challenging, but we can do it. So at the end of the day, it's up to all of us to save the world of tomorrow. It's up to you and it's up to me and um, your mum, your dad, your uncle, your, the guys you work with, everyone. So we've all got a bit to play. Lots of young people are getting involved all over the world. That's just one slide from Kenya. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of these. I think this one is in there, Guatemala. Um, and um, because we've got a very short time, that's as much as I can give you for today. But if you have any other questions, uh, direct them please through Vudi and he will get to me. Uh, he has got other information he can give you, uh, particularly on, on specific things that you can start doing at home. Um, and if you'd like to get that information, as I say, just contact him initially. And if there's anything more Sarah or myself can do, uh, we'd be glad to help. Thank you. Back to you. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dominic, for the very enlightening and insightful presentation. Uh, it is true that climate change is bringing massive disruption to not only living things, but also to Earth. But we can remain hopeful because uh, by making necessary changes, so that we can overcome this crisis. So with that, uh, let me share the screen. So the next question is um, UNDP Climate Change and what we can do by Shireen Hagazi. Okay, so a bit about Shireen Hagazi. Uh, Sherin holds a Master's in Cultural Anthropology and Development Studies from Radboud University, Mich Michigan, Netherlands. Sherin coordinates the youth port portfolio at UNDP Malaysia. It comprises of three programs, Youth Co-Lab, The Movers, and Youth Environment Living Labs. Before UNDP Malaysia, Sherin used to lead innovation teams at Tandemic, conducting field research, defining new opportunities, designing products and services, and prototyping them collaboratively collaboratively with clients. So now I invite uh, Ms. Sherin Hegazi for her presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much everyone for this invitation. Um, I've prepared a few slides uh, to share about some of the initiatives that UNDP uh, is doing uh, with youth. Uh, and I hope that some of these will also um, help you sort of like think of ideas and uh, please also to join the movement of uh, youth uh, being involved in climate action in Malaysia. Um, so let me just share this. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so just a little bit about UNDP. Um, UNDP is the United Nations Development Network that advocates for change and connects countries to knowledge, experience, and resources to help people build a better life. So we are actually in 170 countries, which is a lot. Um, and our main mandate is to uh, work to uh, eliminate poverty while protecting the planet. So um, as you all know, there's these 17 sustainable development goals um, that are essentially our uh, main framework for, for taking action. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but we've heard a little bit about life below water just now, uh, life on land, climate action in, is, a, is a big um, theme right now in relation to COP26 that was just shared. Um, so in relation to the sustainable development goals, we've come up with six key solutions. Um, the first one relates to keeping people out of poverty. The second one relates to governance for peaceful and just and inclusive societies. 
The third relates to crisis prevention and increased resilience. Um, then we have the environment. So nature-based solutions for development are really important. And uh, we're also always working towards clean and affordable energy and women's empowerment and gender equality. So these are some of the solutions that we um, always try to uh, engage whenever we uh, work very closely with uh, within the ecosystem. So we work a lot with policymakers, um, which is in, within the government, uh, but also civil society organizations and, uh, and young people. Um, so I'll be sharing, sorry. Oh. Hmm? Yeah, that's a squeeze a lot. Is, does somebody has a question? I will mute them, Shereen. Sorry for the Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, so yes, so how are um, we working together with youth and what do we do in the climate change sort of like scene? Um, last year, we've uh, done a climate survey under uh, young people in collaboration with UNICEF. Um, this was done amongst about 1400 young people in Malaysia. Um, and most of young people actually think that climate change really is a, is a crisis. And actually nine in 10 young people have experienced um, environment and climate related effects in the last three years within Malaysia. Um, and, and actually the report suggests that youth are sort of like eager to, to take action um, by themselves, but um, it's still sometimes difficult to know where to start, um, which resources to tap into. Um, and there's also a lack of local narratives. So, so what we have done is to uh, develop an initiative around that, which is called the Youth Environment Living Labs. Um, and this is mainly designed around localizing climate narratives. Uh, so you all know the image of like the polar bear and the melting ice caps, um, which, which is often sort of like associated with climate change. But what does that really sort of like say um, about Malaysia, right? We're in, we're in a tropical country as we are. Um, and we want to sort of like with this initiative emphasize local and indigenous perspectives on nature and the environment. And secondly, we really aim to strengthen the ecosystem of actors to nurture today's and tomorrow's youth environmental leaders. So how we are doing that right now is uh, with the following uh, activities. Um, so we've come up with um, a competition that is actually still ongoing. Um, with three different categories. Um, the first one is the elder stories category. Um, and this is about what can we actually learn from the past? Like what are some oral histories and memories related to the environment? And the idea is that um, youth between 13 to 17 um, record an interview with one of uh, their parents maybe, or um, grandparents um, to, to share that oral history. And then the second category relates to local heroes, uh, which is for youth aged 18 to 25. And this is to uh, create a video um, and to discover individuals who are doing great work in supporting the environment. So if you have um, any heroes within your community that you think, oh, these are really uh, worth it in terms of sharing, uh, just record a video and submit it. Um, and then the last category re relates to future visions. And this is about sharing neighborhood scenes, uh, representing the future that you might want or do not want in relation with the environment. So this is a photo essay um, open to youth aged uh, 13 to 25. And then um, we're also sort of like creating a resource hub on environmental action. So. Uh, this will tentatively include a registry of young people in Malaysia and environmental organizations um, that are um, already doing great work. Um, and it will involve stories of local solutions and innovators and actors, um, and also a youth starter kit to sort of like help you with the first steps of, uh, of taking action. And at the same time, because Yale phase one is, is going to close by the end of the year, uh, we are developing a second phase um, in relationship with um, some of the key stakeholders in the ecosystem. 
Um, uh, just to remind you, like if, if you would like to participate in this competition, um, it's going to close soon. It's going to close uh, by the 31st, which is tomorrow already. <laughs> but um, I'm really hoping to, uh, like we, we still have quite some spots. So if you have some ideas, um, do feel free to uh, submit. Um, <clears throat> and then another initiative uh, that we're running is Youth for La Malaysia. Uh, this is a program that uh, is created in 2017 uh, by the UNDP and the City Foundation. And this is mainly to establish a common agenda in Asia Pacific. So it's a regional program, um, especially to empower and invest in young people so that they can accelerate the implementation of sustainable development goals. Um, and the whole goal of this is that young people um, develop their own startup ideas. Um, and we sort of like help you to do that. So it's, it's a process where you can learn to develop ideas, uh, where you learn how to prototype, and then also how to set up a business model. Um, <clears throat> and we're actually going to open very soon um, on Monday with our fourth series um, for young people aged between 15 to 35. And, uh, one of the main thematic areas this year is also around climate action. Uh, so green recovery, sorry, green recovery and environmental health is a main thematic area. So if you have any ideas or if you would like to learn about this process, uh, do feel free to, to join. Um, and we've also, I'll, I'll share the link after this. Um, uh, Hanum is one of our young social entrepreneurs who recently uh, has written a blog about climate change. Um, and she says that the, that curiosity is a secret weapon against climate change. So she, she's really big in recycling. Um, I'll share the blog after this. Um, so you can uh, read a little bit more. And then lastly, um, we're having a movers workshop really soon, uh, this, this upcoming week on Tuesday evening. Uh, which is still open for registration as well. So um, what is Movers? Uh, Movers is essentially a regional uh, movement of volunteers who help to develop a sustainable um, development goal awareness. Um, it's, uh, it's around sort of like developing 21st century skills and entrepreneurial mindsets, um, all fully done by volunteers within the region. So um, the program uses a training of trainer model so if you participate in a movers workshop, you can then become a facilitator and start to um, also share the knowledge of these different workshops uh, in your own communities, in other countries as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're essentially growing the, the volunteers movement in Malaysia. And um, I would like to invite you for this workshop that is happening on um, Tuesday evening. Um, Sorry, I'll share the link after this as well. Um, and those are a few of the key initiatives that uh, we are working towards. So um, I hope you now have some ideas on, on what you can do in relation to climate change. Um, it is a really serious is issue. And I think um, young people are really the future also in um, in making changes right now, right? So we can always say, oh yes, we should do um, these changes in, in the future, but um, if, if we're not going to act now, nothing is going to happen. So um, thank you all for the invitation and I hope to see you um, some other time. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Sharon. Thank you very much for the informative and uh, interesting presentation. It is very inspiring to see how youths are playing a major role in empowering and inspiring others to contribute to the environment. So uh, thank you very much also for introducing the three main programs. It's, it is going to be very helpful for youths like us. So thank you very much. So I'm gonna move on to the next session. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so the next would be testimonials and students discussion by six students uh, with Mr. Sarvanan. So a bit about Mr. Sarvanan here. He is an environmental educator with Conservation International and the founder of Atik PTLTD, a nature adventure firm started in 2019 to advocate nature conservation through adventures. After some years of journey in careers related 
the field of his higher education, he decided to navigate himself back into the environmental advocacy. In 2011, he joined an excellent facility which gave a formal platform to advocate on marine conservation as well. After eight years of leading the education team, he is currently with Conservation International to continue his passion for the environment while constantly putting on the adventure cap to bring people closer to nature. So here are the six students who will be joining us. Uh, Nur Katija from Laka, uh, Dayalini from Slangor, Puga Balaraman from Slangor, uh, JT Lu from Laka, Charmini from Negeri Sembilan, Francesca Lee from Penang. Okay, just a moment, I'm gonna share a video. Okay. Right. So enjoy this video of the testimonials given by all the six students here. Among all the topics, my favorite topic is earth materials and its use. By using three magical words, three are reduce, reuse, recycle. It learned how to make our nation green and free from waste. I watched several YouTube videos from MNS Nagari Similan Malacca's YouTube channel. And the video that I loved the most was about the primates of Malaysia. They mentioned about the species of monkeys, how many species are there in Malaysia, their habitats, and so much more. And I love it because I knew a lot about monkeys than I did before. Thank you. I would like to thank Mr. Woody and MNS team. They provided basic understanding of our environment, such as plants, earth, stars, and animals. So throughout the Eco Partners learning session, I have actually learned a lot and I have seen the earth and how we are humming the earth from an angle I have never before. So there is not one favorite topic of mine. I love all the topics. My favorite topic was primates of Malaysia. The ski leaf monkey only live in Malaysia, Myanmar and Thailand. I've learned that environment is very important so that we should protect it and prevent damaging it. My favorite topic is the talk about dusky langurs and their habits. My favorite topic is the Malaysia forest. It is because tropical rainforest supports the largest diversity of living organisms on the earth. Thank you. Bye. And one thing that I've learned from the acupuncture talks are that how big the environment is a part of our lives that we don't just normally see and my favorite topic is the along the river i just found the talk very interesting and i would love to be a part of more thank you very much hi i'm makati jakra iyesi malaka would like to talk about the importance of rivers why we should take care of our rivers rivers are precious source of fresh drinking water for people across the world Thank you very much for the video. Okay, so I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Simon to conduct the uh, discussion. All right, over to you. All right, thank you, Lenisha. Thank you again. And uh, welcome, students. It's really, really nice to have you here. And that video was really awesome. All right, uh, I see that lots of you like you love rivers, you love the monkeys, you love the langurs, um, quite a lot of things, right? So it's really, really great. And uh, and and of course, I did have this uh, this privilege of meeting you guys a bit earlier, uh, somewhere last week, right? And uh, got to know about what is it that you would want to do in future. Uh, well, uh, probably maybe we can start with the first of you, Kuga Balaraman. All right. Hi, Kuga Balaraman. How are you feeling? Hi, sir. I'm great. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm very happy to see all of you and especially you, Kuga Balaraman. That was really, really nice about your sharing. All right, Kuga, I just want to ask you one question. You know, you have been part of this Nature Heroes. You have been hearing from various speakers, right? Um, after hearing all of this, what is one area or that you would want to bring to your family and try to get your family adopt so that they can also start doing together with you? You can unmute. Uh, 
Okay, let, let me simplify that question. So if you would want to do something to protect the environment, it could be getting onto the mud, going to the intertidal zone and doing something over there, or probably something simple at home, like you just don't want to waste food, for example, or you want to have lesser single-use plastic items, right? What will you choose and how would you get your family to do that as well? I will make uh, creative things from waste materials. All right. So that means that you will be creative enough to repurposing them, right? So that you don't have to throw them. Yes. Um, I will show All right, that's good. And 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 all, oh, what is that? This is a makeup set. Um, I do this from this paper roll. All right, so that's a makeup set. And and did you give it to your mom? And this. Wow, what is this? It is a remote control uh, stand, and this is a plastic pot, a uh, flower pot. Brilliant, <laughs> Kuga, Kuga, that is really, really great. So, uh, so do you do all of this quite a lot? Uh, do you, do you do you share with your friends as well? Uh, yes, um, our club members would do this. Um, in the competition, uh, in the competition, I win a prize for designing um, dress with waste materials and creating these things. Uh, um, wait. All right, looks like Kuga is going to bring something to show us. Wow. This is the prize I won in uh, recycle the waste materials. That's First brilliant. prize for designing a dress for waste material and recycle a creative thing for waste materials. Second prize. Wow, Kuga, I, I, I'm really very proud of you. I'm really proud that I'm talking to you. You are an inventor, right? You're creating things. And I, I am really hoping to see um, a lot more of your creations. And probably someday I can see you in the newspaper and the TV that, hey, this is the inventor, Kuga, all right? <laughs> okay, thank you, Kuga. And now let's move to the next person. Okay, who do we have in line? Okay, probably we can look at uh, Katija. Hi, Katija. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I'm fine. How about you? <laughs> I'm good too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, is that, is that a virtual background or is that your room at the back there? Uh, no, it's a virtual background. But it's beautiful and I hope my, my room is like that actually. <laughs> All right, Katija, I just want to find out from you. You know, um, okay, I, I know that you would want to become a teacher in future. Am I correct? All right, that's great. If you want to become a teacher, right, when you become a teacher, how, um, now, because now you're learning about environment, you have been doing something great about environment, how do you think you want to share about this with your students? Or what would you do as a teacher to your students on this topic? Mm. Or, pro or probably, I learned to them. okay, you will share what you learned to them, right? With them, all right. Uh, but maybe, Khadija, maybe you can tell us what subject would you want to teach in school? Um, what is your I favorite? Really science so i really want to teach at school about science to students wow that is very in line and i think you can really do that right because science and all of this about animals biodiversity and the plants those are all a lot about science right okay that, yeah. that's great <laughs> okay all right um so so um I, I, uh, I want to find out from you, you know, um, 
when, when, when it comes to environmental well-being, how aware do you think people are around you about this topic? Do you think a lot of people know about it? Do you think not many people know about it? I think not a lot because they always just pollute the, the rivers and they don't care about it. Oh, okay, so that, that is a benchmark, right? Because you're seeing a lot of pollution and so probably it's because not many people know about it. So if tomorrow, if uh, you need to go and tell someone, where will you start? Who do you start with? I will probably start with myself and change. Oh, brilliant. Okay, that's really great, Katija, because the change starts from us from you, from me, right? That is really, really great. Thank you, thank you, Katija. I'll come back to you later, but let's go to the next person first. Okay, let's see. Probably we can go for the next person, Dayalini. Hi, Hi Dayalini. Hi, sir. Hi, how are you? Um, absolutely good, sir. How are you? That's great. I'm, I'm fantastic here. You know, you know, you know, whenever I talk to students, I, I really get very excited. I really feel that the energy that I'm getting from the students are fantastic. So I'm really doing great. All right. So Dayalini, can you tell us uh, how was the journey uh, of these nature heroes? What do you think about it? What did you learn? I learned so much things about our environment. Mm -hmm. So my motive is to plant more trees in my future so I can help our environment in a better way. Wow, that's good. Have you started doing that? Yeah, so I planted some trees at my home. Yeah. So I've, I've also uh, planted some plants and flowers at my home. So I love to plant trees and plants it in future. That's great. So, so since you have planted uh, plants, uh, flower plants at home, have you seen uh, butterflies or dragonflies coming by? Um, currently, I see some butterflies at my home. They are so beautiful, and um, they are, yeah, butterfly is only um insect I see at my home right now. That's great. So that that is really really good because at least you have created a habitat for the butterflies, a home for the butterflies, right? Okay, you know, when you talk about butterflies, one of my favorite butterflies is Painted Jezebel. The name is Painted Jezebel. And if you get a chance, maybe you can Google and look for it. It's really, really very beautiful. And it's wonderful in colors, all right? So okay, check sir. them out. <laughs> all right, that's great. Okay, so if 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 uh, um, if, when you go to school, do, do you share any of uh, these efforts that you are doing in your school? Do you share with your classmates? Um. Yeah, I share some information about our environment with my friends and my classmates. Fantastic! That's really really great. So you are also a nature hero here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, Dayalini. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come back to you also again. And next, let's go for uh, JT Lu. All right, JT Lu is from Malacca. He's from form, he's in form two. Right. Let's look at JT. Hi, JT. Okay, I can't hear JT. Saravana, uh, maybe we can ask mm -hmm. uh, Francisca. Francisca is ready here. Yeah? Fantastic. Yes, yeah. so let's move to Francisca then. Hi, Francisca. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Francisca. Francisca, how are you feeling today? Yeah, uh, I'm great. Thank you. All right, that's great, that's great. Francisca, you are from Penang, you are in secondary four, and you would want to become a lawyer in future, All right? Okay, that's yeah. really, really great. Do you know if becoming a lawyer, you are still able to contribute to environment? Do you, have you ventured into that? Have you th thought about that? 
Uh, yeah, I'm aware about that. Okay, what, what is what? it that you think you can do being a lawyer or what you want to do? Um, I think if uh, uh, being a lawyer, I can contribute in terms of like fighting for the environment in terms of their regulations and maybe uh, can help set more rules and laws to the environment so that, that um, people can't do that much damage to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's exactly right. Yes, you, yeah. you can you can influence the the the, the policies, the lawmakings, and everything, yeah. right? That's really great. And uh, and and I personally know lots of lawyers who have been doing and fighting for nature. And basically, it's about standing up for the environment, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and as a student, so so because now you're in secondary four, you're in form four, and uh, you still have uh, a number of years before you enter into the universities to study for law and become a lawyer. But in the meantime, is there something that you would like to do or you would think that you can do, maybe within your neighborhood or within the school? Uh, mostly, I think if. I'm in the school, I can assist my teacher because currently I'm still in the green education club and my teacher is actually doing a lot to help the environment. Yeah, she's very determined to do so. So I think what I can do is uh, I can assist her uh, in maybe recycling, re uh, reusing and that sort of stuff. That's great. That's great. Um, you, you, know, you know, some of the things that... Um, you know, people like you, you know, you want to become a lawyer and, and I'm sure you would have trained yourself to, to, be, to be vocal, to be good in your writings and everything, right? I think there's a lot that you can choose to do even now, even voicing out or, or sh giving feedbacks, right? And um, mm -hmm. talking about, uh, you know, how you appreciate the works that is being done by various organizations or even the, the, the government on how they protect the environment. So these are some of the things that you can choose to do. All right. That's fantastic. All right, Francisca, I will come back to you. Nice talking to you. And let's look for probably Shamini. All right. Hi, Shamini. How are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. All right, Shamini, I know that you want to become a biologist, correct? Okay. What, what inspired you to become, to, that you want to become a biologist? I think after all these talks, I never... Just it's like an eye opener to all these things you just don't know, but normally. That is true. That is true. You know. You know. I still remember the time when, when I was in school, just like all of you, right? Um. And 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 I always wanted to, you know, do something about nature. But the thing is that I never had those opportunities at that point of time because I just didn't know, and we never had internet, right? So we can't really go and look for it. But I think you guys are. Uh, fortunate you you guys are lucky it's really a gift that you have all of these opportunities and you get to know what's going on and you get to plan what you want to do and a lot of things and that's really really a good thing for you guys okay shamini i just want to ask you um that you know since you have undergone um uh, this entire nature heroes right uh is there any change in your thoughts towards nature after learning the struggles of our environment yes yes what what would be the main uh, thought that came to you? Uh, especially after today's one, uh, mm -hmm. I learned so much about my home. I'm from PD also. I just ah. whenever I go to the beach, I don't see normally see all these things. All right. Have you taken part in any beach clean before? Uh, yes, I have. That's great. That's great. So, did you also see? Um, uh, or, or, or what type of uh, item that you saw most? Is it styrofoam, just like how Ken saw, or anything else? I've only seen one puffer fish. Oh, a puffer fish. Wow, lucky lucky to see a puffer fish at the intertidal zone, all right? That's really, really great. <laughs> okay, that's, that's great. Uh, I, I have another one question for you, Shamini. Um, so so uh, what I want to know is that... Um, uh, you, you know, because you say that you want to become a biologist and you want to, and that's some kind of science topic over there. Has that been motivated by this NHT talks? Uh, 
or was it something that you have been interested since young? Uh, no, it has been motivated by this talk. By this talk, all yeah. right. So Kent, Dominic, myself, we, we have all uh, made some change. We have some made some influence in the students, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, Shamini. I'll come back to you again later. All right. Thank so you, now, sir. next move to JT. I think JT is not here. Okay. Yeah. But we will okay. really get to see his video just now, right? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, it, it's a, uh, it's. Uh, I'm sad that I couldn't talk to JT, but but I would have been interested to find out from JT because he would want to become a veterinarian, and I would like to know what inspired him and why he want to choose that line. So, but but never mind. Uh, I'm still happy that we managed to see that video. So, uh, I just have. One last question for everyone. Maybe you can just take a 10 second to just quickly answer me this. All right. Do you think that any career choices that you make, you can still fight for the environment? Francisca, do you want to go for it? Yeah, um, sure. I think, yes, it is uh, absolutely possible that I still fight for the environment, even if I choose to go for law uh, because there's uh, we have to study every law in every aspect actually so it's not just only about criminal or about corporation we also learn the environmental laws and I'm sure I can somehow influence some uh, policies in the future. Fantastic answer Francisca. <laughs> All right Katija. Um, I also agree because that any career will relate with the environment. Yes. Yes, any career can relate to the environment, right? That's really, really fantastic. And Kuga. Yes, I asked my patient to practice this career for their further health. All right. That's great. Oh, yes. Kuga wanted to become a doctor, right? <laughs> okay, that's great. And for Shamini? Uh, I think any career can help the environment. All right. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And, and I think um, um, we have just seen that happening quite a lot, right? Yeah. And Dayalini, what do you think? Yes, so I can make and fertilizer with um without chemicals and using compost methods so i can help our environment fantastic and dialini wanted to become a scientist right <laughs> okay yes, sir. maybe i can just share a little bit about me because um, um as i said i had been i i grew up in a nature environment with a mountain at the back and i used to go to the mountains with my dad all all every weekend you know i really enjoyed and i really was into nature and i really wanted to do something for nature but i never knew at that point of time there was something uh, like a study related to this i never had that exposure so i studied uh, other uh, industry so I, I went for uh, computing as well as engineering and I started my career in that but eventually now I have become a, a conservationist uh, you know I'm with Conservation International and I'm bringing people around talking to them about animals observing and all of these things so definitely we can do a lot of stuff but that is by choosing to change a career right career choice and uh, the path that I would want to go but after coming to this environment I realized that you can be anywhere and you can still do something about that uh, on environment basis. For example, like us in Conservation International, recently we, uh, part, uh, we, we partnered with uh, Boston University where we sent uh, a, a ship, a, a sea ship, right, a vessel to the middle of Pacific Ocean so that we can do a study about the deep sea uh, creatures, animals, conditions. Right, And when we send those ships there, we know that in the ship, it is not just scientists. It is not just conservationists. It's not just uh, someone who have learned um, to become conservationist, right? But it is about everyone. We need someone that controls uh, the ship's movement. 
we need someone that knows how to study the depth of the water, right? We need the people who learn about science of biology and, and, and everything to do with the environment, right? Uh, to study about the water quality and, and the samples that we are actually collecting from the part of the ocean. We also need engineers because humans can't dive into the deep ocean. So we needed to send robots right like a like a, uh, like a vehicle that just floats and goes and we need to control that from the ship itself and when we do that we need engineers to make sure that the, the robot is in a good condition and everything so if you notice there's so much of a thing that can be done and everyone is inside there and they don't have to study environment but they can still contribute in the office we have uh, accountants we have auditors we have our finance people we have uh, uh, operation people, a lot of them. So basically, uh, anything that you study, somehow or other, you can link it. And for Khatija, I would want to tell you that being a teacher, definitely you can do that. Because even if you are a teacher, for example, a language teacher, if you're teaching Bahasa, for example, you can always have a comprehension, right? Mahaman, right? In a story that can be read about, about some environmental news, for example, you can bring an environmental news cutting to the class for the students to read for their um, uh, oral test, right? So a lot of things that can be done. So uh, I think we will be closing this session soon um, on this, this uh, forum, right? Um, um, by just saying that it doesn't matter where you are, what you are doing, I'm sure all of you can contribute. And you guys over here, you are doing really, really, really fantastic. And I just saw a message from uh, uh, Dr. Sean over there in the chat that uh, he says that bring on your stories and bring on your dreams because all of these are amazing and inspiring. And you may be inspiring us, you may be inspiring many other people, and you may be inspiring all your other friends as well. All right. So well done. And thank you for all of you for doing whatever that you are doing. Okay. All right. Back to Linisha. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Saravanan, for conducting this discussion in a very enthusiastic and fun manner. We all enjoyed it. And a round of applause to all the six students for being very enthusiastic and proactive about nature. I hope that all of you will carry the same enthusiasm in contributing towards nature. All right, so I think I they deserve a round of applause. So, uh, I'm not sure you guys can hear this. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, session. So this is the final session, a wrap-up session by Mr. Wooty. So, uh, yep, take it away, Mr. Wooty. Thank you very much, uh, Linisha. And uh, thank you, Sarah, Saramanan. It was a great discussion and all the students, very, very brave uh, students like Katija is only uh, standard four and, uh, you know, very brave and uh, Kuk, uh, Kuk, Kuga, I always have problem with his name, sorry, it's a bit long, Kuga Balaraman. Okay, well done. And all the rest of you, very nice, very nice. And also to the speakers, I can for intertidal zone. Uh, as we knew for, for uh, allowing us to take a, a five minute break from all the, the sitting down. And of course, Dominic was summing up all the current issues we have. And uh, many thanks to uh, Shireen for making it here today from UNDP representative. We're very happy to have you here and to share your programs with us, okay? So let me just, um, as we knew, could you have shared the screen, please? Thank you very much. My laptop is hang, so my, uh, my good friend there is gonna to do. Okay, so we've come a long way from June the 12th. And you know, after 11, this is the 11th program, 11th talk, so it's about five months. It's a long session, but uh, you know, we, we are glad you are with us and we have been getting very good support. And uh, we're very happy, all the volunteers are very happy to, to actually put the energy because we really, really need to, to educate uh, everybody. All right, next please. So those are the programs we've, we've covered. Next screen, please, uh, Sweeney. So 11 topics, on average, we had about 100 participants uh, per session, uh, meaning that not 
we have some in, in Facebook, we have some on inside the, the Zoom, and some will come back and watch the session because not everybody can fit into this particular time frame. Uh, because of the recordings we have, uh, they definitely they can come back uh, anytime to watch and do the quiz, you know, to, to ensure that you have a base, I mean, that you understand. And I've checked the e-certs we've, we've issued out, uh, around 700 e-certs have been issued out and we are giving out uh, 35 prizes. Okay, the prizes uh, will be shipped out soon. My apologies uh, uh, with the pandemic. So we, we're not doing much on the prizes, but definitely we'll ship out to you. That's, that's my guarantee. So we've done a lot of talking from Nature Hero Talks 1, 2, 3. So we're gonna be going towards Nature Heroes action. Okay, so the next session we'll be going for about Yunga. It's called Yunga. Uh, Yunga is the Youth United Nation Global um, Global Collaboration. Okay, next Global please. Alliance. Global <laughs> Alliance, sorry. I'm just struggling for words there. All right, next please. So this is very exciting. Uh, we've actually reviewed the, um, the uh, syllabus that is put out by Yunga and uh, we'll be starting, we are now in the planning stage, we'll be starting these uh, badges, you'll be getting badges, all right? So that means uh, once you've completed um, particular um, activities, okay, we're going towards activities instead of just listening to talks, all right? So we would like to have, uh, because now the pandemic hopefully is over soon and we've uh, all been vaccinated, so we can go out uh, opening up and to do these activities, so we have, um, we'll be starting in March, we're in preparation stage, uh, three badges for, for the coming 2022, uh, climate change, biodiversity and the ocean. And uh, we were doing each batch, we have eight practical activities. And uh, we are in, of course, in the process of getting the MOE approval, we need to write to them. And uh, hopefully by March, we will get that approval. And all these uh, activities will be recorded in the Eco Partners online. All right, next, please. So we, we are very excited for this program and uh, we hope you are for the Yunga. And uh, we'd like to thank all the volunteers. So we have uh, wonderful speakers, wonderful hosts, and of course, um, uh, you as a participant, right? Next, please. Okay. So these are all our volunteers. So if you have time, you know, uh, you can just message me. We need, uh, we need more volunteers actually for coming year as well. All right, even students, you know, if you have your nature club, uh, maybe you have some time, you know, we, we can do remote, uh, what do you call that, uh, support, like helping us to, to upload the Facebook page or even like updating the app was also something that I can teach you uh, to do, all right? So on that note, uh, let us um, uh, thank everybody and thank you for participating. And we'll play the second half of the video uh, where we uh, give our gratitude to all our volunteers. Uh, Lenisha, over to you. All right, I'll go to just a moment now. Thank you. Okay. And special thanks to Derek I think he was doing this uh, until two o'clock uh, this morning. All right, thank you very much.
Lenisha, you there? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, 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 just just a reminder. Maybe can can show the quiz which is open now. Okay. All right. All right. All thank right. you. Over, back to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to share the uh, where you can find your quiz uh, link. So before that, let me uh, highlight on the follow up action. Uh, what you can do is share with us what action you are taking to help Mother Earth to reduce climate change. It can be done at home, school, or workplace. So the instruction would be to name activity you're doing to reduce climate change and describe what you're doing in your daily activities to support Mother Earth. All right? Please participate in this follow up action. And then we'll proceed. Yeah. So you can get your quiz link here. Uh, just um, click on the SDGs, what can we do? And then you'll be uh, led to this kind of page. And then you just uh, click on this quiz uh, button here. And yeah, you can answer the quiz now. The quiz link is open. So feel free to uh, participate in the quiz. Uh, it's open for 24 hours. Okay. All right. So um, let me stop sharing the screen. And get that. Okay. Uh, sorry about it, just a moment. Uh, all right. Okay, so as I mentioned just now, the follow up action, you will earn 50 equal points. So be sure to participate in it. Okay, so um, we have come to the end of this uh, event. And uh, with that, we officially sign off uh, for this year and we'll continue and uh, we'll see all of you next year for a fresh and exciting start of uh, Nature Hero Talks 4.0. I hope this uh, year, this year's uh, Nature Hero Talks uh, has given all of us an opportunity to realize the importance and the significance of our environment and we'll also continue to raise awareness in your own ways to protect and preserve nature. So a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. So the change that you bring uh, starts from you. Has the, it has the ability to transform the world. Just keep on doing your best for the environment. Okay. So uh, the e certs will be ready by 1st December. And the Nature Hero Talks 4.0 will uh, occur on March 2022. So don't forget to join us again. And a uh, big thank you to our volunteers, uh, speakers, Ken Yong, Junio, Saravanan, Dominic O'Sullivan, and Sharing Hagazi, uh, co-host, Mr. Saravanan, technical support, Mr. Buti, and quiz master would be Zoe. And a big thanks to you, our audience, for making this happen. And uh, see you all next year. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yay, see you next year. Yay. Yeah. Next year. I see you guys in Central yeah. Tuan soon. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Ladisha. Thank you. Who's going there in an hour's time? Thank Where? you. Bye. Central Tuan. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uti. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Uncle Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Uncle Saravanan. Thank you, Uncle Saravanan. Thank you, Uncle Saravanan. Thank you, Professor T. Yeah, good photo. I'm putting your air. Yeah, remove all the spotlight. They're all right. One time here. Group photo. We have group photo done already, right? Did we? Yeah. Yeah, take your photos. All right. We did. We did photos. Can what? You, You're taking photo again? Ah? Can you just turn on your video? Hold on, I got not a good background here now. <laughs> In the toilet, are you? Ah, happy Deepavali, yes. Put your yeah. birthday. Oh, oh yes, happy, happy Deepavali. <laughs> Three, two, one, smile. Kalama. I have to see my picture. Kalama means what? <laughs> okay. Nice. Happy to everybody. Thank you to all the kids, right? Happy Deepavali. <laughs>
yeah. on the fourth. Yeah. I think yeah. on the fourth. Yeah, yeah, next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. For Thank you teacher. for guiding your students. Uh, take care for now. Thank bye -bye. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you in March. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. I'm gonna do a quick term or we are done for, for the year. Wow. <laughs> we're done for the year. You wanna do a final movement? I know. <laughs> Good job, guys. Good job. <laughs> that was nice. Bye bye, Yovan. The adults want to speak. Bye <laughs> <laughs> bye. 50 percent suddenly disappeared already. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it the moment that Sweeney say that the adults want to speak and 50% of the children gone? <laughs> no, 50% of the adults disappeared. Oh, the adults. <laughs> we have what? Okay, Harris is here. Uh, now, now got time for smoke. Uh, Thank you, sir. Q&A or whatever you want to do. <laughs> Thank you, Kuga. Well done, Kuga. Thank you. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you, Ken, you're coming to Tanjung Tuan? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, what time you want me to come over? Wow. I'm, already, nice. I'm already here. Five o'clock. You're already, already here. there? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. You're, you're sitting on top there listening to us. Uh? <laughs> I'm at Pantai Chermin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Pantai Chermin. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, because I'm meeting somebody over here. About slightly after five, Ken. Ken, Ken, anytime. I'll wait for you. No problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, see you there then. Thank you. Okay. okay. So we have Steven Nandan still here. Pugalendi still here. Susin, yeah. Okay. okay. Bye bye. Okay. Get to go. Susin, Harris. Bye bye, Steven Nandan. Bye bye. Oh, <laughs> I got to go. Okay. Uh, okay. Just uh, remove. Okay. Bye bye, children. Bye, bye. Yeah, I got to remove them. Mm. Okay. Hello. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Inisha, were you nervous? Huh? You were speaking so fast. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay. so wow, fantastic forum. Uh. Saravana, yeah. very good. Very thank good. you, thank you very much. <laughs> really, 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 really uh, uh, bring bring out the children. Really brought them out. Yes. Yay! <laughs> I I still missed one question that it was right here, and then uh, and then um, I was mindful about the time and I missed it. So there was one question that I would wanted to ask them that what is the <laughs> one thing that they would want to tell everyone. Um, yeah, I, I, I missed out that one. <laughs> I think so. the students were very nervous and they've never had it. And I think when they see themselves in the spotlight, even when so I was like, <laughs> 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 like one minute, Saravanan doesn't work. Like, I think uh, for you, you, must give five minutes. Uh, because looking <laughs> 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 at the team at Linisha, we were like, oi, hi. Ken went Ken went along. Yeah, the time went on because of Ken. So it's good to have speakers know how long they're given and then uh, just come in for us to do, to, to intervene. Yeah. And then it doesn't help Wuti suddenly say that <laughs> his, his, his laptop hang. Ah. Yeah, my laptop suddenly froze. Right. Then, but but I, I cannot restart the laptop because it will shut everybody down because mm -hmm. I, I'm the one who started the meeting. Right. Ah. So just now I was on my phone. Just now when, when I was talking on my phone. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah. I see. So when you get the WhatsApp, right? My phone is with my son. So <laughs> wow, what's this? Huh? Okay. So <laughs> it's nice to have that. Then we know how to support. I think yeah. having the tech support is really important as well. Yeah. Right. Inisha also right. Having extra one person to show the video and then you emceeing also helps. Rather than the MC, yeah. everything, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very true. Very true. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Next time we, we can plan that. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah. But... yeah. And yeah, having the move between also is good. Like, give them suddenly some, some difference. So today is like, wow, different thing. Yeah. Thank you for participating. <laughs> I saw all of your participating. <laughs> was, was there a lot of participants? 
they didn't turn oh, you mean uh they don't turn on the video but those that did the extra ones uh then i could see the movement yeah. some mm. could do that's why i put up the challenge for them yeah it would be great if we can have at least they see with the eye you know and the fingers and then the body and then yes. we mix yeah. then you'll be complete at least i know we have that maybe next time huh, we can have a little short short ones like this yeah short yes. very uh, nice i yeah. enjoyed that and it was quite hard actually i could say <laughs> i dropped most of the time brought the socks most of the time like... i think linisha because in baratan natyam you're not you don't throw anything down right okay. uh, uh no right you are always have yeah. you don't throw yeah no, you yeah. can catch you realize ah i got to have something down there yeah. especially this part throwing the ball yeah. <laughs> <laughs> linisha does baratan natyam how can this be hard <laughs> <laughs> Maybe coordination is bad, I guess. Right. But it's good to do that. Then your left and right becomes uh, good. Thank you. Mm. Doing it, I saw Wuti doing it. Wow. <laughs> and then it helps everyone to do it. Yeah, but but I need to be frank. I need to be ah. frank. You know the part about that putting at the back yeah. and dropping. You know, I drop so many times. <laughs> if if you want, you take a bean bag. A bean bag is yeah. softer and more forgiving. Yeah. 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 Oh, an orange, yeah. But if you try it, then you realize that means we always go in front. We forgot, we forget what's behind. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, yeah, that support behind is so important. Yeah, and another thing, Srinio, I realized, you know, that part when you were saying that, you know, pass to the back and bring yes. back to the front. Mm. Oh, that was really, really great. I felt mm. like there was like the joints are like loosening on my on my body. <laughs> It's like. Right. Yeah. That's the midline uh, that we talked about. So for the adults, I always say it's not midlife crisis; it's the midline. <laughs> yeah. Lots of us cannot do. So if a child cannot do that, you find that he cannot bend down. Mm -hmm. He cannot call. He cannot pick things up from below him. And we always think, why can't the child study? It's not that. It's because his coordination isn't there. So that's mm. where he and myself. That's that's what we want to bring down to the kindergarten students, because by doing this, we get to arrest their issues. Ah. what we call the primitive reflex integration that we all have to do we miss that you know during uh, maybe when we were child we miss that and the children nowadays don't get to go to nature they don't get to play they don't get to be a kampong boy they don't get to do that so they are always studying so they need yeah. to move and then they can pick up more so we yeah, forget yeah. that yeah so please please do that right whatever just with the ball so and just with the ball yeah. doing this And then uh, underneath the feet to do that, that and is throw great. and catch. Ah, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> that was so. Well, it's a rhythm. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, it might. Yeah. Yeah. Done. Yeah. So it's amazing how some students over six weeks, then they start having initiative. They can start cycling. They start going out to the river and can step on uh, the autistic child. Ah, uh, they can step mm. on, on land on soil. Which they've never done before. So just mm. by doing exercises for the toes. I see. I see. Yeah. So this is called primitive reflex integration, which I do. Ah, I see. Yeah. So, so new. I just want to ask one question, if if yeah. I have time to ask, right? Uh, what question? No, no, our time. <laughs> oh, yeah, out of time. I still want to ask one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, we are going live actually. Oops. Live. Oh, I, I can. Uh, no, no. I I stop the recording. Oh, I stop okay. the recording. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we are on Facebook Live. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the question that I ask, I have is that, you know, you know, because you were saying that uh, even autistic students, you know, 